Okay. So we covered the fungi last week, and today we're going to start the parasites, but we're not going to finish the parasites. It's a very long, it's a very long and important unit or important topic, right? And so I'm, I'm never going to be able to finish this in one lecture setting. So when we come back from spring break, we will so today we'll cover the protozoans. When we come back from spring break, we'll cover the metazoans and the exoparasites. And then Liz will have to make popcorn because she's going to like that kind of stuff, right? But um, for today, we're going to look at, at the protozoans, right? So if we look at the parasites as a whole, there are three different groups, right? So the parasites consist of the single-celled organisms that we call protozoans. And this is an example of, of one right here, right? This is Giardia. Um, causes a type of dysentery, although not usually very serious, right? Single-celled organism, right? Metazoans are Liz's favorites. It's all the worms, right? So this is a hookworm, right? And so you can see it's got things that we would consider teeth. And although they're structured a little bit differently than the teeth that we, you and I have, they can use those to attach to uh, the mucosal layers and the structures of the body, right, when they're infecting it, right? So the metazoans, there are three groups in there and we're gonna talk about them. And then we're gonna talk about the exoparasites. Exo means on the outside and then parasites really mean things that are gonna be in causing really an infestation. They don't really cause an infection because they're on the outside of the body and they're just kind of taking a little bit of nutrients from us or taking a little bit of our blood or things like that. And so they really are considered exoparasites, right? So if we look at these organisms a little closer, right, the um, protozoans have five groups that we're going to be interested in. Now there are about 32 different groups of protozoans, but most of them have no clinical relevance. Only five of them do. And so the five that we're going to talk about are the following, right? So we're going to talk about the archaea, the archaeozoa, right? We're going to talk about the, the glenozoa. And we're going to talk about the amoebozoa. Then we move into talking about, so Archaeozoa and Euglenozoa move by flagella, the Amoebozoa move by pseudopoda. Then we're going to look at ciliates or the Cilophora. They move by cilia, right? And so that's four. And there's one more that's really important, but they don't have any type of motility. So you can already appreciate that these are really the primary characterization that we use here to put them in taxonomic groups are how they move, right? This last group, um, AP complexa, do not move, right? So they have to be then in a fluid matrix to which then they can come in contact with the cells they're going to infect. And the cells just kind of bump into them. And they have this little apical complex that they can use to get into cells, right? Now there's one more group I'm going to add in here that belongs to the group apical myplexa, but they're a different group, right? And so I add them here, and um, that's the Dionophyta. Now the Dionophyta are not a parasite. They're an algae. They are alga, right? They are an algae, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, I don't have any place else to talk about them because they don't really fit into any place else. They fit in here, except for they're not a parasite. They're an alga, right? And so these are important because they cause intoxications, right? Now it's not an infection, but they produce toxins that can affect the body and they produce a very powerful toxin called zaxotoxin. That's a neurotoxin and causes paralytic shellfish poisoning. And we're gonna be talking about them, okay? So that's the protozoans, what we'll cover today. The other group, um, so again, these move uh, are these are classified by how they move. The next group are the metazoans. 
And the metazoans are classified by the three S's, right? And the three S's are um, segments. Do they have segments, right? Segments, shape. Shape, are they? Are they flat? Are they elongated? Are they round, right? And sex. And that doesn't mean do they have sex. It's how do they fertilize their ova, right? So are they monaceous? Do they have one organism that produces both sperm and ova? Or are they dioecious? Do they have a male and a female gender, if you will? Okay. So that's the metazoans, right? And so the metazoans have three different groups, and they are the trematoda, they are the flukes, not a worm. Okay, people say they're worms, but they're not worms, right? The cestoda, they're the tapeworms. Not a worm, right? People say that's a worm. It even has tape, it even has worm and tapeworm, but not a worm, right? They're slimy and squiggly, and some people think they're worms, so well, they're not. The last group is a worm, right? Uh, and that's the nematoda. And those are the round worms. And those are true worms. The only true worm in the entire group, right? So metazoans have three groups. They're classified by segment, shape, and sex. Trematoda are the flukes, flat, right? Cestoda are tapeworms, not a worm, but they're flat. They have segments. And then nematoda are true worms. They're round, they're cylindrical, and they have grooves, but no segments, OK? So those are, that is the metazoans. Now the exoparasites are, are easily classified by the number of legs they have. I misspelled parrot, hold on a minute. So the exoparasites are classified by number of legs, and people get these confused all the time. They call a they call a a grasshopper a spider. You know, they just all kinds of craziness, right? But the, it's real easy. There are only two groups. There's the insecta, they have six legs. Right, all insects have six legs, right? And then there's the arachnida. have eight legs, like the spiders. But we're not interested in spiders or parasites because spiders aren't parasites, right? The insects that have that are parasitic are things like fleas and lice and bed bugs. Those are parasites that are insects. And arachnida, too, there's a mite, right, like scabies. And then there is a tick, right? And so here's a tick right here, right? And so you can appreciate it's got eight legs. Count them one, two, right? We can count them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That means it's closer to a spider than it is a flea. Are you with me? So not all creepy crawly things are insects, like a lot of people think it's, they're all insects, right? But like I hear people call spiders insects all the time, and I just shake my head. I don't try to correct them anymore because then they think you're a know-it-all and, you know, oh my gosh, you understand science. Don't, don't, don't bring that science thing over here because I don't want to talk about it, right? But um, the insects and the arachnida, although they can, they can actually cause some problems in us, right? Um, and they do meet the definition of a parasite. Uh, more and more interested in, um, in these critters as these insects as a vector, right? So who's heard of the term vector? Anybody heard of the term vector? What's a vector? 
What do you think, Elvira? Yo, Elvira. I don't know. That sounds familiar. Oh, don't be thinking about the mathematic uh, vector that bisects a, a, a line. Not that one, right? Liz, what's a vector? I'm only thinking of the math term. Oh, <laughs> okay, fine. A vector is an in, is an organism that can harbor and transmit an infectious agent, but it itself is not affected by the infectious agent. So a mosquito is also a vector, but a mosquito is not a parasite. Are you with me? Because the true definition of a parasite is that it has to be in a symbiotic relationship with another organism. And a mosquito doesn't have a relationship with anything it takes a blood meal from. It just simply takes a blood meal as part of its life cycle and then it leaves. It does not stay with us. Okay? Everybody, everybody see the difference? So I'm, we're much more interested, epidemiologically, we're much more interested in the insects and the arachnids as vectors than we are as true parasites. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of weird if you have a tick embedded in your tissue. And when, um, no, no, tween. So rats would be a reservoir, right? And so reservoir is different, right? So a reservoir. I should make my R's differently because they look like these. A reservoir is defined as a an organism that can harbor or carry an infectious agent, right? So rats would be a reservoir for things like uh, tularemia or plague or uh, toxoplasma, a bunch of them, and they, they carry a bunch of things, okay? But they're, they're not really a vector, although I can see how some people might confuse those terms, right? And really, I'm pretty forgiving when people are talking about these things because I have to remember that not everybody in the world understands science. And so when they start talking about these things, I'm pretty forgiving, right? There is one more term, right? Since we talked about vector, right? Um, God. So when we talk about vector, right? This is a, an arthropod, really. That's another really cool word, an arthropod, right? What's an arthropod? Um, Mr. Aaron, what's an arthropod? I am uh, not too sure. Okay. Is it the one well, that has an exoskeleton? Yes, that's very cool. Oh, looky there. Elvira to the rescue. Yeah. An arthropod is something that has an exoskeleton, right? So it's everything from an insect to an arachnid, but also crayfish and lobsters and crabs and shrimp and all those things are arthropods. <coughs> The arthropods that we're interested in, of course, are the insects and the arachnida. Uh, but a vector is defined as usually an arthropod um, that can transmit an infectious agent from one host to another. A reservoir is an animal, an, an, an organism that can carry or harbor an infectious agent and it can spread it to other things, right? Um, and then there's another term that some people will use a big umbrella to cover everything called a vehicle. But the term that we use for inanimate, for inanimate objects that can transmit an infectious agent from one individual to another is called a fomite. Uh, so right, it's one of my favorite words, fomite. A fomite is thing like a pencil or a pen or a, tele, a, a cell phone, a cup of a cup, you know, a, a Kleenex, you know, all all these different things. All, they're they're just inanimate objects, and they can they can be used as a vehicle to transmission, right? So, somebody blows their nose and has COVID, and then they're in an office, and later that evening, somebody on the custodial staff comes in there and notices only one Kleenex in the trash can, goes down there with their hand, picks up that Kleenex, and throws it in the bigger um, container of trash, but then has their hands contaminated with COVID and they touch themselves on, on the eyes because their eyes itch and then they pick up COVID that way and then they go home and they give COVID to other people, right? So yeah, it, 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 it's just crazy how these things get transmitted to one individual to another, 
Okay, so is everybody cool and clear about these terms, right? Reservoir, fomite, vector, arthropod, um, parasite, um, and there's one more host, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Okay, plus everybody recognizes that three different groups of parasites, right? Protozoans, and we talked about them, right? Metazoans, a larger multi-organ, multi-system organisms, right? We talked about them. And then the exoparasites, those things that really don't cause an infection, but they're on the outside of the body, so they cause an infestation, okay? Questions. So you never should say, my daughter is infected with lice. That's, that's not a true statement. Um, that might be the way people talk, but that's not true. Because in order to have an infection, you have to have inflammation of the tissues. And you're not going to have inflammation of the tissues if you have lice. You're going to be scratchy and itchy, but you're not going to have inflammation. Okay? So it's an infestation. Okay? All right. Here we go. So if we think about parasite or parasitism, right, it's a symbiotic relationship. Two organisms living together, one benefits from the relationship, but the other one is harmed at the other's expense, right? And so the term here, of course, that we need to know is parasite. That's the, and that's the organism causing the problem. Now, it doesn't necessarily think it's causing a problem. It's just leaving, it's just living out its life cycle, right? And its life cycle is part of being inside of you, right? The other one, the other term that we use is host. So host is kind of the house of the parasite. And there's a primary host, there can be a secondary host, and then usually humans are the definitive host. The definitive simply means it's the final host. Right? Are you with me? So, for instance, with Lyme disease, right? Lyme disease has a vector. It is the um, it is the tick, but the but the organism, uh, the bacterium, doesn't really undergo any kind of developmental stages in the tick. So the tick is just a vector. Right now, if we think about malaria. Malaria, its vector is the mosquito, but in the mosquito, there's a developmental part that goes on in the mosquito. It's really important. The life cycle doesn't continue unless that development part happens. So that mosquito is also the primary host. It needs that mosquito in order for part of its life cycle to continue, okay? And then we are the definitive host for malaria. And that's where a lot of really interesting physiological things happen with the parasite itself. So is everybody cool? Everybody understand the difference between a parasite and a host? And, and really, I, more than anything, I want you to know the definitive host because we're gonna be talking about us, right? This, this course is mainly interested in talking about organisms that affect humans, right? Not can, you, can you explain the definitive host one more time? I had to walk away. Sorry. The definitive host is um, the final host. It is the it is the host that that the adult form or the or the active form of the parasite is in. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Bless you on that one. Okay. So if we look at the protozoans, right, because we're going to mostly be talking about protozoans today, we're looking at the kingdom protista, protus, right, they're chemoheterotrophs, they're single-celled only, they are absorptive, so they release exoenzymes to the outside of their cell, and then they bring in the nutrients through their plasma membrane. Um, they can also be ingestive because some of them have oral cavities, right? It's not really a mouth, it's just with how they filter stuff in, and then they can use them. Some of them, like the amoeba, just use pseudopoda to grab nutrients, and then they bring them into their cells through endocytosis. So there's a lot of mechanisms involved here, right? Almost all of them are modal, right? And because 
almost all of them are modal. That's an important characteristic of how we put these organisms into different groups. Remember, there's over 32 different um, there's over 32 different groups of classes of uh, protozoans, but we're only interested in the ones for this course. We're only interested in the ones that can cause infection. Okay. Almost all of the protozoa that we are going to be interested in are going to form cysts. There's one of them that doesn't. Now, this is a different thing. This is a different use of the word cyst. So, usually when you say, uh, my friend, my friend Amy has a cyst, right? Um, that means a fluid filled sac, right? And that can be a lipoma. It can be it can be a pilocyst. It can be a Bartholin cyst. It can be, there's like all kinds of these different cysts that they can be, right? Uh, it can be um, an ovarian cyst. There's a bunch of them. ovarian cysts. There's a bunch of them, right? That's different than what we're talking about here, right? So you have to use the word and understand the word and the context by which it's being used in. So cyst, when we talk about parasites, is much like an endospore, right? The cyst is a protective, it is um, a, a part of the of the life cycle that allows these things to survive really harsh conditions, right? And also, the cyst is the way that the organism gets into our body in many cases, right? Because a lot of them are fecal oral transmitted. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Okay. So does everybody understand the difference between a cyst, a, a pathological problem in tissue, to assist the the refractive dormant protective state of a protozoan. Everybody understand the difference between between the, those that word and how it's used in context. Okay, any questions there? Hello. No, sir. No. Okay, thank you. No. All right. All right. Let's go on. So here is so there are lots of really important parts of the life cycles of parasites. And that's one of the coolest things about parasites is they have evolved with us, right? They become really effective at being parasites to us. And therefore, part of their evolution is that they have developed very, very complicated. They develop very complex life cycles. And so the reason they've done that, we believe, is because when you have a very complex life cycle, it's hard to get rid of you, right? So if you have a parasite in your body, it's really hard to get rid of them, right? Uh, you have to pay due diligence to them. You have to get treated for a longer period of time. It's not like a bacterium two weeks. Sometimes with one of these parasites, you might, you might have to treat it for life, right? Like malaria. Some forms of malaria you'll never get rid of, right? You have to treat them for life. So, although there are a lot of important stages, two of the most important stages in the life cycle of a, of a protozoal parasite are the cyst and the troph, a trophozoite. So we know what the cyst is already, right? Now, it, um, it is environmentally resistant, so it's protective, right? Uh, but also it's how the infectious agent gets into the body, right? It's how it's transmitted. And in many cases, the cyst has to get into the stomach so that the stomach acids weaken the cyst so that when it gets into your small intestines and large intestines, right, it excess, the cyst breaks apart, and out come the trophozoites. The trophozoites are the modal, they're the ones that cause all the damage, the infections, uh, they're the ones that, uh, that are the active infectious agent in our bodies, right? But in our bodies, they are, they are really effective, but they're really, really fragile in the environment. They cannot survive out there in the environment. So then, again, we believe that these parasites have developed these really complicated life cycles as a means to be an effective parasite in us, right? And that's true. So here you can see the cyst going through the mouth, again, going down the esophagus into the stomach, and the stomach, the stomach acids break it that break it apart, make it weak. It gets into the small intestines. It breaks apart. It forms the, the so each of those nuclei are going to become a trophozoite. Are going to become an active, free swimming, infected part 
of a life cycle. So they become the they become and cause problems in our bodies, and eventually some of them will form cysts again, and the cysts will be liberated out through the feces. And if you're in the wild and you're an animal that has a parasite, then you know the when you poo, when, when the animals poo out there, they drop all these cysts and other animals come in and eat grass and the cysts are on the grass and they pick up the parasite and they go on from there, right? So a long time ago, when I first started teaching as an adjunct at ACC, I had a collector's permit and I would collect organisms from the environment to dissect um, in the lab. Now, I am a little bit different when I collect. I, do, I never collected living things. I would always tell my students, be on the lookout for a fresh roadkill that's either a possum or a raccoon, because those are primary, those carry lots of parasites. And so um, they would call me and they say, Pro V at the corner of, of Stasny and First Street, there's a, there's a, I just saw a, a possum get hit by a, a car. And so I'd run out there and I'd check it out and the possum was dead. I would pick the possum up, I'd bring it home, I'd freeze it, uh, and then I'd take it to class and we would dissect it. And in one possum, one semester, we found over 60 parasites. It was a great lab that, that there was, people were so excited about it um, because they got to see this, right? Uh, it was an amazing thing. Yeah, Liz, you would have geeked out over it for sure. But uh, then 911 happened um, and um, I wasn't allowed to do that anymore. ACC got mad at me because they didn't want me to potentially bring in inf infectious agents into the lab that we weren't controlling. I said, look, they're all level two organisms. They didn't want to hear it. So I, we stopped doing it because ACC said no. But I do have some videos that I sometimes show about some of the dissections that we did because they were really, really cool. Any questions? So Liz, maybe, maybe they're. Uh, I have to go get them. They're at. Uh, they're at uh, Riverside. But yeah, what about? Oh yeah. So, um, um, Leo, I would never dissect a bat, a bat because I'm going to tell you, Leo, that um, if you see a dead bat, I'm 99% sure that bat died of rabies, and that's the one infectious agent you do not want to mess with. Okay. So bats are reservoirs for rabies. And I'm going to tell you, in, you know, in Texas, we worry about the skunk and the fox as being the primary reservoirs for rabies. But any place there's a large bat colony, like in Austin, I worry more about bats than I do uh, any other organism for carrying rabies. So what I'm going to tell you, Leo, and everybody else, is that if you see a dead bat, do not touch it, right? report it to the animal control folks. They'll come over and pick it up and they'll test it for rabies, right? Um, but you just have to be really, really no, not, not, not. So um, you're right. I mean, part of the, part of the mutation that occurred with coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, um, was really in a bat and then a pangolin, right? But, but that species of bat isn't found here. Uh, and we don't really have close contact with um, with the animals like they do on some of the other continents, right? Like like uh, on the Asian continent, um, where they're really in close contact with some of the animals, um, like like in um, in a wet market, right? So we don't really have that. So it's less likely that we're going to see a lot of jump jumping of genes from one from one reservoir to another. So most of the most of the mutations that occur for some of these viruses are going to occur in in other countries that have a lot more that are a lot closer to proximity that are a lot closer in proximity to the animals that they that they are uh, using as a nutrient source. Okay? So Leo, I wouldn't be worried about I wouldn't be worried about con contracting I wouldn't worry too much about contracting coronavirus for bats 
I would be much more worried about contracting rabies from bats. And I'm gonna tell you right now, Leo, I would rather have coronavirus any day than rabies. Rabies has a 99% mortality rate. Coronavirus has about a 23% mortality rate. I'll take my chances with coronavirus any day. Not rabies. Rabies is a bad boy. Don't mess with it. So here's the deal, Leo and everybody else. If you've got kiddos, and I don't know if you've got, if you've got kids or not, Leo, but anybody who's got kids, you should train your kids so that they understand that wildlife is an important part of nature and it's important to be able to observe wildlife from a distance but you should never allow your kiddos to go and touch wildlife right for one thing think about it right if you if they can go and pick up a bat in the middle of the day bats are nocturnal and if they're out in the middle of the day, there's something wrong with the bat. Don't touch it. Same thing with coons, right? Raccoons are nocturnal. If you see a raccoon kind of um, moving around during the day, it, it there's something wrong with it because they don't do that. They don't hang out during the day, right? Um, Wait, so then, the, Yeah, when, go ahead. When I was in Florida, I saw like a family of raccoons that were in like a in like a trash can and I was out mm -hmm. like, like sightseeing, um, but yep. they didn't think that there was anything wrong with them. They just seemed like they were, you know, looking for now, food. Now Mick, now Mick, don't go get an all Mickey on me and go touch raccoons, right? <laughs> I do almost it. did, I went towards them and yeah. then they, they, they yeah. scared me off. They well, that's me. the other thing, that's the other thing about wildlife is usually most of them are afraid of humans, right? So for instance, the deer that live in my front yard and they're there every every evening, they like my front yard and they eat everything. I can't grow anything in the front yard. They want to get in my backyard because they know it's a plethora of food back there, but they can't. But so they they never let me get no, near them, right? So um, when I come out the door, you know, they like, all of them are looking at me. And if I get even near them, one of them will sound the alarm. Anybody ever hear of the alarm of a deer? What does it sound like? Anybody ever hear it? I've, I've never heard it. I don't know. It's a snort. It's something like this. <sighs> Are you with me? And what that means, it's an alarm, and that means everybody get up and run, right? That's that's exactly how they communicate. So they snort, and that basically what that means is get up and run. We don't know what this guy's up to, but he doesn't look cool, right? So the deer will not let – I mean, they've been living there for years, and they still don't let me get near them, right? Uh, but – Let's say one morning I wake up and there's a, an adult deer in the front yard. One of two things has happened. One, she's ev she's uh, about to give birth or two, she's sick. And either way, you should not get near her. If she's about to give birth and you get near her, she might kick you and it hurts. And if she's sick and you go near her and you touch her and then you pick up tularemia or something from her, then you're going to be in really deep trouble, right? So the rule, Provi's rule of nature is observe nature, but from a distance. It's a beautiful thing to watch. I have three hawks that live uh, right around my house, right? One of them is a breeding pair, and one of them is trying to move in on the female, but the male keeps keeps um, knocking it back out, right? So it's really beautiful. And I have four owls that live in my backyard. And those owls, I kind of, at night, I'll go out there and listen to them um, kind of talk to each other. Um, and I have coons and skunks and all kinds of things, but I watch them from a distance. We have cameras all around our house, not for burglars, <laughs> for wildlife, right? And so we've seen uh, bobcats, we've seen ringtails, um, and then, you know, you see coyotes and all the other things we normally talk about. But the things that we... The things that are not very uh, often that we see that we've seen are ringtails, a bobcat, and we saw a really big porcupine about two weeks ago. So um, those are things that are not normally around um, our house, but, but we kind of live in, in an area that's getting more developed. And so as they're getting more developed and these animals are, are finding places to live, and since my backyard, our creek runs through my backyard, and they like that area, right? But again, Leo and Mick, 
do not touch wildlife. All right, uh, noted. I won't. <laughs> okay. Now the Texas State campus is a little bit different. Anybody ever been on that campus? Yeah, there, are, that. <laughs> there are squirrels on that campus that are almost as chunky as I am, right? Yeah. And so those things waddle up to people and they're so used to people because people feed them all the time and they get mad if you don't give them any food. So there, you still shouldn't pet them, but be aware that you're going to have squirrels coming up to you all the time because they're so used to people feeding them. And so there, it's a little bit different, right? Any questions? Everybody understand the difference between a cyst and a trophozoite? Okay. Yes, sir. Let's go on. So. Here are the different organisms that we're going to talk about, right? And um, so the archaeozoa, the amoebozoa, the salophora, the euglenozoa, the, the AP complexa, and then we're going to talk about the dianophila, sometimes called the fire algae, the pyrophora. We're going to talk about those also, right? So the two kingdoms that are in the biggest flux right now taxonomically are the kingdom fungi and the kingdom protista. There's just so much new information becoming available because of all the research that's going on that there have been lots of changes. And so this is the older classification uh, that we used to have. Some people still use it. It is old. And so if you hear people use that particular classification, then you know they're not up to date on their stuff. This is a new one. Right? And this is what we'll be using to talk about these organisms. Okay, any questions? So, a lot of the organisms that are protozoal by nature are going to cause problems in the uh, elementary canal, right? Because they're they're transmitted they're transmitted to individuals fecal orally. What does that mean? Well, that means that somebody like Elvira, my, uh, Elvira, I'm just using you as an example. Elvira might go to the might go and pick up her her kiddo and kiss on him, right? But no, unbeknownst to her, her kiddo was outside and her kiddo saw some scat on the ground and decided he didn't know what it was. And he picked it up and he touched it and he said, oh, poo, and then he dropped it, but he didn't really wash his hands, right? And so let's just say that scat came from, uh, I don't know, let's just say it came from a raccoon, right? So um, then he comes in his house and he tells his mom, mom, I'm hungry. And so, what she does is she makes him a sandwich and he eats it. Well, he then eats the cyst of, let's say, Jardia that was in the scat of the raccoon, right? But then, you know, being a loving mom, then Avira goes up to her and just gives him a little bit of a, of a kissy poo on the face. And so he had the cyst on his lips. And so now she gets the cyst in her mouth and they both come down with giardiasis a little bit later. Well, that's fecal oral transmission, right? But it happens even even easier than that. Let's just say that our colleague Aaron um, uh, was out um, picking up a, a dead animal and touched the dead animal with his bare hands, came back in, and then was going to go and wash his hands, but he touched three doorknobs on the way to go in to wash his hands, right? And he touched the the um the the those all the faucets right he contaminated those doorknobs and the faucets and now let's say that I don't know the rest of his family I'm just making this up um the rest of his family comes in they touch the doorknobs one of them washes their hands one of them touches to clean off the um the handles of the of the faucet but really just wipes them down with the with the with a little bit of a, of a damp rat, rag, doesn't really use any kind of disinfectant. Right? Now, those family members all get contaminated with the feces or, or the material that was on that animal. And so they pick up the infectious agent, right? And this happens all the time. So one of the, one of the most beautiful words that has ever been used uh, in medicine is this term called idiopathic, right? Who knows what that word means? What does idiopathic mean? Mick, what does idiopathic mean? I like, if you were to tell me, I'd be like, oh yeah, that's what it is, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. I'm okay. sorry. Right. Hey, Twee, what does idiopathic mean? Leo, somebody, Liz, 
like um, does it mean it's, it's unknown? It's an unknown source. That's right. So, if for instance you go to a physician and they say, "Hey, Aaron, um, you have idiopathic gastroenteritis," right? So you're like, "What the hell is that?" <laughs> and he tells you, "Oh, it's just an inflammation of the stomach and the small intestines." Uh, caused by probably something like helicobacter pylori, but we don't know how you got it. So we stick the term idiopathic in front of it. And what that means is you've got inflammation of the stomach and small intestines, but we don't know how you got it. Are you with me? So that's what idiopathic means. And so a lot of these infections are idiopathic. You get them and then you never know. So in my case, uh, I will tell you my story uh, of Jardy in just a second when we, when we talk about it. Okay, any questions? about the fecal oral route. So you can see how it works, right? So somebody gets contaminated, the cyst gets into the intestinal tract, it exists and then you have an infection. The trophozoites are feeding, they're moving in the body all through the intestinal tract, they're replicating. At some point they're causing inflammation, causing infection. Some of them are gonna form cyst again. And when they form cyst, out they come through the feces. And if you're, uh, if you're an animal out there in nature, then the feces get released into nature. Other ruminants or other organisms come up and consume or come in contact with those with that feces. And so then they come down with the infection. It's not so big a problem in the United States because of the way our infrastructure is set up. So when you go to the toilet, you flush down and it goes into either a septic tank or to a sewer system. And then that, that gets that gets eliminated from causing infection. But in other countries where they don't have uh, the types of infrastructure that we have, and there's a lot of them, unfortunately, um, then they potentially can spread the infectious agent uh, throughout a community fairly quickly, right? And so this happens quite a bit through the fecal oral, oral route, not just parasites, but also bacteria, right? You can look up, you can look up out outbreaks of gastrointestinal infections and you'll find a whole bunch of them throughout the world. They're just, they're just very normal. Okay. Questions. All right. So we're going to talk about the archaeozoa first. Archaeozoa are ancient protozoans, right? They're multi-flagellated. Uh, they don't have mitochondria. So that's why they're called archaea because they're much like the bacteria, right? So their electron transport system is located in their plasma membrane like the bacteria are. Uh, and a couple of organisms here are Giardia lamblia and Trichomonas vaginalis, right? So uh, let's talk about Giardia lamblia first, right? So Giardia lamblia um, looks like this, right? And there he is. This is somebody who even kind of looks like me, drinking water like I would out of a pond or a river or whatever. When I'm hiking, I just take it. I'd run it through my filtering system that I carry around with me or I have iodine or chlorine tablets that I would treat before I drank. Uh, but I have been known when I'm in New Braunfels or in certain parts of San Marcos to stick my head in the water of the of the springs that feed that, right? So the springs in Ocarina Springs in Texas State or the springs of the Comal River, the headwaters of the Comal River or Atlanta Park in New Braunfels. Stick my head in there and just drink water, right? So when we moved, I'm telling my story of Jardia, when we moved to Oak Hill um, on, many years ago, um, the first house we lived in um, had a well and I found out we had a well and I opened the well up and my neighbor next door told me, oh, the, the people who were, who were living in that house before you, they dumped paint in the well. And so I said, oh, great, a contaminated well. So I tested it for organics, didn't find any organics. I tested it for pathogenic bacteria. I did my own testing. I, I don't send it any place. I do my own. I test, I test my testing first. So I did I did tests for bacteria. Didn't find any bacteria. I said, I'm like, oh, there's nothing wrong with this water. So I pumped some of it out, and I put it into a big old beaker. And I told my wife, look at this. It's free water. And so I drank a whole liter of it uh, right in front of um, that maybe 500 milliliters, uh, but I didn't really test it for protozoans because I thought at the time there was no way a protozoan got in here, right? But evidently they did. So about a week later, I had a really 
um, I had a very acute case of giardiasis. Right? I had an infection by giardia. And I knew it because I tested my own um, material and I saw the cyst of giardia in, in my material. So I went to the physician and asked for metronidazole to take care of it. But boy, was that an experience that I don't want to relive, right? And so you have to be real careful when you when you come in contact with these organisms and you have to get them treated pretty quickly. Now, I probably would have never died, but um, but boy, is does it wreak havoc um, on your intestinal tract. Um, and, and so you just have to be really real careful. It produces a very greasy, malodorous type of uh, excreta. Right, and so it's a classic symptom of having giardia. Right, any questions? Right. So Mick, uh, you grew up in Pennsylvania. What part of Pennsylvania did you grow up? Like central Pennsylvania. Oh, so there's a lot of really pretty bodies of water there, right? So yes. Have you ever drank any water out of some of those lakes? Um, <clears throat> out of the lakes, no, yeah. okay. no, because okay. that's not. I was no, that no, we haven't. That's not probably a good area. <laughs> well, I mean, I, well, okay, but I mean, closer to the Pittsburgh area, you get more industrialized, right? So yeah, and but, like but, Philly doesn't have like the nicest, like cleanest water. I mean, Belfont, where where like my mom lives, actually has like a fountain running right through it. The water there is probably the cleanest you're gonna get. So yeah. Yeah, the thing that I remember about the Philly area was all the goose poop. Everywhere there was goose poop everywhere. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a problem. I, I went to play golf one time, and uh, everywhere my golf ball went, it got poo on it from the geese. All right. It, it was just an amazing thing. Also, and, and my friends there said, "Oh, this is not normal. They're just kind of flying through the area right now, so they're leaving a lot of their droppings." There was a lot of droppings, right? And so I kept thinking to myself, oh, I hope I don't get Jardy again from a goose. Right? That'd be terrible. But, you know, that's the way it is. Okay. Any questions about Jardia? Okay. So it has a cyst and it has a troph. The next organism, Trichomonas vaginalis, is an STI. What is an STI? What's an STI? Sexually transmitted infection. That is correct. So this is a sexually transmitted infection. Unfortunately, it's asymptomatic in about 50% of the people who have it, right? So it's estimated that in, in North America, and let's just, let's just focus in on the United States and Canada, that there are approximately uh, 3.5 million new cases of trichomonas every year, right? That's by modeling. So if you say 50% of those are asymptomatic, right? So that means that there's 1.75 million people running around with trichomonas and not know they have it. And that can be a little bit disturbing if you're an epidemiologist, right? Because it's out there. And trichomonas is not the most common of all sexually transmitted infections. The most common is, of course, chlamydia. Yeah. But here you have trichomonas, right? And it doesn't have a cyst, right? There is no cyst in it because it goes from one hospital place, the penis, to another hospital place, the vagina. Right? So it goes from penis to vagina, from vagina to penis, back and forth. And so if one of the, if one individual is diagnosed with trichomoniasis or any sexually transmitted infection, then um, both parties should be treated for the sexually transmitted infection because if not, if the other person has it, you're just going to continue to to spread the infectious agent from one person to another. Okay? Any questions about trichomoniasis? So remember, these are archaeozoa. They have flagella. You can see the flagella here, right? You can see the flagella right here. This other thing, this little thing here that looks like a little spike is called an exostyle. And that's the way it attaches to the tissues it's going to infect. Okay? We'll talk about it. Later on, when we talk about sexually transmitted infections, and we'll look at the symptomology. Right now, I'm just giving you an overview of the organisms themselves. All right, any questions? So that's trichomonas. All right, we talked about trichomonas and giardia. Let's move on to talk about the euglenozoa. 
Now, the euglenozoa, I'm going to use the hemoflagellates as an example, right? The hemoflagellates mean that they are organisms that have flagella, but they like to infect the blood. And so remember, euglenozoa have flagella, but they also have mitochondria, right? So because they have mitochondria, um, they are in a different group than the ones we just talked about, the archaeozoa, that had flagella, but no mitochondria, right? So these are more evolved. So you can see the evolution of the organisms just by looking at these two, right? One of them looks like it was at one point much more related to uh, the bacteria, right? Because it doesn't have mitochondria and its uh, electron transport system. It's in, in a plasma membrane of the archaeozoa, but here, the euglenozoa, they have mitochondria, right? The two organisms that we're gonna be talking about or trypanosoma. SPP means multiple species. And so we're going to look at trypanosoma brucei. Oops. Which causes African sleeping sickness. And we're also going to look at uh, trypanosoma cruci, which causes Chagas disease. Right. Let's go and talk about African sleeping sickness first. So the vector for trypanosoma uh, brucei or gambians is the setsi fly. So you can see the setsi fly has a piercing part, right? So it goes and takes a blood meal, it pierces the integument, takes blood, but then it injects the trypanosome into the body. And over a period of weeks to months and sometimes longer, uh, the infectious agent, the trypanosome, will grow and multiply in the body, and eventually it becomes neuropathic. It's called African sleeping sickness because people uh, look like they're asleep, uh, but really what's happened is the nervous system is just shut down, and so individuals then uh, pass away because their nervous system is shut down. They stop breathing. Right? They look like they're asleep, but they pass away because the eventually the autonomic nervous system just shuts down, okay? This is bad. Right? Now, we can treat it, but unfortunately, the place in the world where it's most prevalent do not have a lot of um, resources. And so we lose people to African sleeping sickness on an annual basis, right? Closer to home, we have another guy that is trypanosoma, and this one is trypanosoma cruci. And so this one causes Chagas disease. Now, uh, Cruci is the scientist who first discovered Chagas disease. Dr. Chagas was the first one to describe the signs and the symptoms of the disease, right? And so we pay them both honor by naming this organism Trypanosoma cruci after the scientist who first, first, uh, who first characterized it, and then to Dr. Chagas, who first, um, who first developed. The, the workup for the for the syndrome that we know as Chagas disease, right? So Chagas disease is typically found in South, Central, and Mexico, Central and South America, but we now know it is in Texas. Um, it hasn't been uh, it hasn't been reported in people in Texas, but it has been reported in dogs, and we know that it is in Arizona. We've had about we've had about um, twelve cases reported from Arizona that are endemic. Uh, that means that they're that these people have been in Arizona all their life. They never moved out or visited anything, right? So we know that shock is disease in the United States already, and it's going to become a problem. We're going to have to deal with the vector for Trypanosoma cruci is the Regiviate bug. This is what it looks like, also known as the kissing bug or the assassin bug, and this one adds insult to injury. So where the Sitsi fly came in, took a blood meal and injected the organism in. This particular organism will hit a vascular part of the body. Usually it's gonna be the lips and goes to the lips of the face. And it's so light, you can't even feel it. You're asleep and you're asleep and the organism lands on your body. It takes a blood meal, but to add insult to injury, it defecates before it leaves. And when it defecates, the Trypanosoma cruci is found in the feces of the Regiviate bug, it crawls out and gets into the portal where it took the blood meal and into your body. And then over the next months or sometimes years, the organism causes damage 
and it usually causes intestinal um, damage, um, GI tract damage, or it causes a cardiac myopathy. It, um, so it causes cardiac um, cardiac damage, heart damage, right? And so um, you can see how problematic this can be. Now we've seen it in Texas and dogs, right? I, as a matter of fact, um, a, a, a friend that I used to have called me over to his place and said, can you check my dog? Because there's something wrong with it. And the dog was in the backyard. And the dog was probably about seven years old, should be running around having fun. But this poor dog was um, just sitting there, like really sullen looking. I knew by just looking at him, he had some kind of infection. I didn't know what it was. So I started to look at the dog. I said, you're gonna have to take this dog to the vet. He says, I don't have the money to do that. I said, what do you mean? You own a dog and you can't take it to the vet? He said, I just don't have the money to do that. So I, I rolled the dog over and underneath, I found about 24 different Regevia bugs, these things, right? They had been feeding on the dog. So I told the guy, I said, look, your dog has probably got Chagas disease and you can treat it by just giving a metronidazole. You have to take it to the vet. He said, I can't do it. So what I did was I took the dog and I put it in the car and I took it to the vet and got it treated. And the dog was like perfectly happy and, and after that and he stayed with me for a little while. But the guy came over and said, can I have my dog back? I'm like, no. I said, you can't take care of your dog. You're not gonna get it back. And so uh, I kept the dog for a little while and then I gave it to another person who I knew would take really good care of it. But this guy does not like me now. Well, that's just too bad. If he's going to treat an animal that way, I don't really care to be his friend, right? So I told him, I said, you should never own another animal. I said, you shouldn't even have children, right? Because if you can't take care of a dog, there's no way you're going to be able to take care of kids, right? Uh, so he needs a lot of growing up. But nonetheless, he doesn't speak to me anymore. I'm okay with that. Okay, Quest Jones. So very complicated life cycle, check it out, right? So, I mean, again, remember, they developed this really complicated life cycle so that they can have an advantage over us. Look how many different steps are involved in the life cycle. And this isn't really a complicated one at all, but it is, okay? Quest Jones. All right, let's go on to the amoebozoa. The amoebozoa moved by pseudopoda, all right? I'm gonna talk about interamoeba and acanthamoeba. And really, with acanthamoeba, you could even throw in Neglaria there also. So here, uh, they move by pseudopoda. Here it is, right? And they, that's the way you take in food. Now, a couple of them, most of them are commensalistic. They're not going to be problems. But a couple of them, a few of them can be problematic. One of them, Entamoeba histolytica, uh, can cause amoebic dysentery. And this is the one that you have to worry about uh, where people think that uh, if they go to other countries and just simply um, drink only frozen alcoholic drinks, that the ice and the and the alcohol are going to kill these organisms. Remember, they have a sterin cyst, and the cysts aren't going to be affected by the cold, or it's not going to be affected by um, the alcohol. And so, when we were younger, right, we would go. We, we had friends that lived in McAllen. Uh, McAllen, um, if you don't know where that is, it's it's a border city. But we would go down there for spring break and then we'd go over to Mexico. And my friend and I would always be kind of the designated people who didn't really get drunk. But we would help everybody else get home afterwards. And they would always say things like, be sure that you drink frozen drinks only and out and that there, you know, there's plenty of alcohol on it because that's going to get on. No, no. So of course my friends didn't understand science, but um, I tried to tell them, and then they always worried um, afterwards that they were going to get sick. And on occasion, one of them got sick with amoebic dysentery. It's treatable, right? You don't have you people don't die from amoebic dysentery anymore. It's treatable. So, um, but you know there, we don't just we don't hear about it very often because of the infrastructure we have in the United States. The other organism, uh, from time to time, we hear about it. We just heard about it this last um, this last summer after that big hurricane that hit um, uh, around the Houston area and uh, went over and to 
uh, Louisiana. I don't remember the name of the hurricane anymore. But um, Acanth amoeba and Naglaria, they're amoeba that like water. And so here you can see is an individual who was wearing contacts. And uh, Liz, check it out. So the amoeba got underneath the contact and it started to degrade the eye itself. Now, this eye is not, you can't repair it, it's gone, right? But that's, that's, that's damaged by amoeba, right? That's an amazing amount of damage. So this person, I don't understand why people have to go swimming with contacts. I just don't get it, but they do, right? And here's some kiddos playing in the water and that's fine. But if the water is 80 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer, uh, get your kids to go a little deeper. Uh, and you gotta be careful because if they can't swim, you know, problematic. But the amoeba like the warm water. And so they're in here and the sister in here. And so you splash around, these things can go up into your, into the nares through the nose and then go through the blood brain barrier. Very few organisms can go through the blood brain barrier, but they, but they, some can, the amoeba can. And they get into, they get into the brain and they cause PAM. PAM stands for primary amoebic meningoencephalopathy. What that means is that they are amoeba, they get into the brain and they cause um, swelling of the meninges, meningeo, encephalopathy and the brain, and, and encephalopathy or encephalitis is, and swelling of the brain, okay? These, these are, these are uh, amoeba you don't wanna mess with, right? Um, so it's a canth amoeba as one of the genus, the other one is Nuclearia. All right, and so there was a case of a canth amoeba infection in Houston, right after the big hurricane this last summer, where there was a little kid playing in a, in a fountain. Well, the, the water system had been disrupted and somebody let this fountain continue to run while it was running with untreated water. And one of the little kiddos, uh, you can read about it. One of the little kiddos got infected by an amoeba and the amoeba got into the brain and it killed him, right? Uh, the parents didn't know that um, the water was dangerous, right? Uh, but, you know, uh, th those, there are always these stories that are just heartbreaking when you hear about them, right? Any questions about the amoeba? So how do the amoeba move, Mick? They move through um, no, cilia. What? No, not cilia. Um, flagella. No, not flagella. Um, Starts with a P. Pili? Pseudopoda. Pseudopoda. Okay. okay. Now, Mick, we're going to talk about the cilophora. The cilophora move by cilia. Okay. So here you have these organisms that move by cilia. Now, most of the cilophora are commensalistic or mutualistic. As a matter of fact, do you guys know that termites can ingest the wood? but they cannot digest it. So they have to rely on the ciliates, on the, on the organisms that are ciliated, the, the protozoans and the bacteria that are in the intestinal tract of the termite to break down the wood, right? They can ingest it, but they cannot digest it. So they're, the termites are in a symbiotic relationship with, with these organisms, it's pretty cool. Some of them are dangerous, but not very many. One of them, Valentinium coli, causes dysentery, right? Now, remember, most of these organisms are beautiful, right? This is Stentor, this is Paramecium. They're just beautiful. You can see the cilia here, and then Peritrichus to the cell. You can see the cilia here. But most of these guys are not dangerous. The ones that are, are going to be fecal orally transmitted, right? And so they have cysts. And look, this is a pretty, this is a pretty easy, this is a pretty easy life cycle, right? So you can see the difference between the trophozoite, it's more oval in shape, and the cyst. And this is a troph, this is a cyst, right? And so it's just kind of showing this, right? So the cyst contaminates fruits and vegetables, fecal oral, right? Uh, and so it, it doesn't even have, have to happen at the same household, right? So you can get, and there's cases like this all the time. The last big case where we had an outbreak of, um, protozoal infection was Cyclospora, 
and it was um, it was on strawberries, right? And so we're coming up on strawberry uh, growing time right now. So strawberries are about to become really cheap at HEB, right? Because around the April May time frame, the strawberries come uh, and and they and they get harvested. I hope that the strawberries didn't get destroyed by the big freeze, right? Um, but um, I'm hoping for some better prices on strawberries because they're kind of expensive right now. And when I say that, they're like $4 for a basket right now, $4 a pound. But I love strawberries. Um, and then hopefully they're going to become pretty inexpensive. And plus, HEB has this ice cream that they make, and it's called um, Poteet Strawberry Ice Cream. And it's delicious. So if you get a chance to try some Poteet Strawberry Ice Cream, you better try it if you've not tried it. It is the best strawberry ice cream ever. Okay, so again, you have Balantidium coli. It's a ciliate. It's a, it belongs to the Silophora. It moves by cilia, and it causes uh, a form of dysentery. Any questions? All right. So the AP complexa are the bad boys of the group. Like they even have really seriously scary names, right? Plasmodium, Babesia. Right, cryptosporidium and cyclosphora. Right, to me those are like ah, scary names, right? But they, but if you understand them, then you're not so scared of them because you understand how you can stay away from them. Something like um, like malaria is so complicated. Look at all the different stages in their life cycle. Right, it's an amazing thing. I'm gonna break down the life cycle for you guys um, because y'all are gonna be responsible for the, for the malaria life cycle. Right. And we'll talk about it a little bit later, All right? So the major pathogens in the group of of the AP complexa are Toxoplasma gondii or Toxoplasma, Plasmodium. Falciparum is a bad one, but there's five other species of malaria, and then Cryptosporidium. And so we're going to talk about these, All right? Malaria is the bad boy of the entire group. It is it is a big time killer. Right, about 350 to 5 million cases of malaria worldwide on an annual basis. It kills between 1 and 3 million people on an annual basis. That's a lot of people to die from an infectious agent that is treatable, right? Um, so right now, COVID-19 is still getting all the headlines, right? Um, but I think... Um, if we just are a little bit more diligent for a little bit of time, then COVID-19 is going to become what we call endemic. It's going to be here all the time, but it's not going to be causing as much devastation as it has been right? because the vaccines will put it in its place uh, until the next big outbreak, right? The next big thing. Uh, and so, but malaria has been, we were talking about pandemics, right? Malaria has been, a big player in the world uh, for a long time. Now it's not pandemic because in order for it to be pandemic, it has to be on all seven continents. And um, for the most part, the European continent uh, is not gonna support malaria because it's too cold. The temperature's not, it's not tropical enough. In the United States, we used to have malaria, but only in Houston and uh, in Louisiana in Alabama and in Florida. So we used to have malaria. We did such a good job of getting rid of the Anopheles mosquito that malaria just went away. And so if we have cases of malaria, it's just people who have immigrated here and are now living here. Uh, and sometimes they had malaria and they just, you can't get rid of it sometimes, especially like uh, falciparum malaria, right? So, um, Again, it kills a lot of kiddos, right? And so that's a really sad thing to lose children to an infectious disease. This is one of the best images I've ever seen. It comes out of the National Geographic. So this is a scanning electron microscope, a micrograph of, um, of red blood cells. And two of them are infected with the malaria parasite and the malaria parasite is erupting. It's coming out of those particular, of those particular, um, um, cells. Um, a shot for what, Miss um, Asiata? A shot for what? 
No, um, we don't really have, we don't really have a lot of good treatments here in the States. I mean, we do, we have the, the quinines and, and hydroxychloroquine. Um, but I mean, people come here all the time without ever being tested or upfront with, with having malaria. Right. I, um, when I worked for Abbott Labs, I worked for them for about nine years. And um, I had a friend from Nigeria. And um, in that nine year period, he, he was diagnosed with falciparum malaria, which is the worst form of it. And in those nine years that I worked there, um, he got sick twice with malaria. He had a, 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 a recurring bout of malaria twice, right? And so he was out about three weeks each time, but you know, he took hydroxychloroquine and some of the other for malaria and he was fine. But, but it's, it can be a dis devastating disease. Now, now Asiata, what, what, uh, where, where are you getting this information from? Cause if I'm wrong, I need to find out. Um, because I don't want to tell something that's not true. Um, can you help me out with where you're getting that information? Um, okay. So can you ask them what, when they come to the United States or do they, when they come to the United States or when they go back to the, to the West, to West Africa, when, when they go back, do they get the, do they get the treatments? Usually it's going from here to there. So you get protected against malaria, but coming from there to here, we don't have malaria here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, I, I don't think so. But just to be sure, will you ask your parents and let me know what they say? Because I would really like to update my um, information if I'm wrong. Okay. All right. So, has a very complicated life cycle, and we're going to talk about the life cycle. Probably not today. That'll probably be the first thing we do when we come back from spring break. Okay. And then um, Toxoplasma gondii, right? So this is the one that people can get uh, from several different reservoirs, birds and mice and rats and deer, all kinds of different things, right? Where it's more likely to cause infections in the immunocompromised individuals, people with AIDS are fighting cancer and are immunocompromised because of that. There is a very small percentage, a tiny percentage, of women who were pregnant who developed toxoplasma gondii, toxoplasmosis, toxoplasma gondii infections when they were pregnant, which then caused them to lose the, the developing fetus, right? And so there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of um, information put out and published about this, right? So here's the big thing, right? If you are a pregnant female, you should never ever clean out the litter box because Toxoplasma gondii is released from the kitty uh, in the feces and also from birds, if you have birds that get out, right? And most people don't have birds to get out. Cats get out. So if the cats get out just for a, just a few times, cats are natural hunters and they're gonna go hunting. That's what they do. And when they hunt, and they kill things that are in the environment, a lot of times they're gonna pick up toxoplasma. As a matter of fact, there's been a published, a, a paper published where it said that the, um, that the rats and the mice who develop toxoplasmosis um, become brave because of a molecule that's produced by the parasite. And they then will challenge the cat. So they'll go and, pick a fight with a cat. And of course the cat's going to win. It's going to kill the mice. But then when it kills the mice, of course it's going to eat the mice and now it's going to have toxoplasma. And then it comes into your house and you pet it and you, and it, cats are pretty clean, right? They're going to only go poo in their litter box, right? So they go poo in the litter box and then they release the, the oocyst. I'll show you what they look like in a little bit. They release the oocyst into the litter box and then Pregnant females can go in there and by scooping it up, they create a little bit of dust. They can breathe the dust in and the, and the, the dust can be a vehicle. Uh, it can be a fomite by which 
the infectious agent gets into the body and then potentially they could come down with toxoplasmosis and lose their baby. So the, the, the easiest way to do this is to mandate that when the, when the lady of the house is pregnant, that somebody else cleans out the litter box. You don't have to give up your cat, but, but the lady of the house who's with child should not be cleaning out the litter box. That means the other guy in the relationship who's not doing anything for nine months should do the litter, to ch change out the litter box, right? Now, ladies, you have to train your, your guys on how to clean the litter box because if you just tell them, will you clean the litter box? What they're gonna do is they're gonna take a litter box outside and they're just gonna throw it the contents of it into the yard thinking that they're just going to add more nitrogen to the yard. It's going to make it grow better. Right. And that's not true. What you need to do with, with uh, the litter box is you should scoop it up and treat it like normal trash. And so when you do that, um, you'll scoop it up, you'll put it into a little container, wrap it up and then throw it in a regular trash. And therefore you're not going to have a problem with toxoplasmosis. Okay. Any questions? So here's the interesting thing, right? Yes, it can cause abortions in pregnant females, but it can cause all kinds of infections in the immunocompromise. And the leading trend right now is that you have uh, retinopathy occur with toxoplasmosis. So it destroys, it destroys the eyes and you go blind, right? If you're immunocompromised. Any questions? All right, again, a very complicated life cycle, right? there are those little guys right there that become brave and they go and they go and uh, you know beat up the cat or try to beat up the cat and the cat kills them and then they develop toxoplasmosis cryptosporidium now this one is closer to home we've had an outbreak of cryptosporidiosis in the in the late um 1990s right some of you weren't even born yet um, there was an outbreak of cryptosporidium parvum in um, Cedar Park. And then in the mid uh, 2000s, there was an outbreak in, um, in San Antonio. So it's been around, right? Uh, the biggest outbreak uh, of cryptosporidium has been in Milwaukee, right? And um, there was a big outbreak there. You guys can look it up. But uh, again, fecal oral route, this is an organism that gets released in the feces. Look at the electron micrograph of a cyst, right? Here's the cyst, the cyst is breaking apart right here. And what you're looking at is a trophozoites coming out of the cyst. And here, this area right here is called the apical complex. The apical complex acts as a battering ram. So remember these organisms are non-modal. So they're in this matrix, this fluid matrix of the body and cells bump into them. And when cells bump into them, they can get into the cell through that, using that apical complex as kind of a battering ram, right? And then they cause infection, right? And that's really interesting to think about how that works. Okay, questions? All right, so complicated life cycle, um, but you're not gonna be responsible for any of the life cycles except for malaria. The last group of, the last group of organisms we'll talk about today are the dinoflagellates also known as a pyrophyta, right? And so this is what they look like. Um, the, major, the major genus that we're gonna talk about today is called Karenia. And uh, you can see here is a person um, who is splashing around in the ocean and you can see all the dinoflagellates are fluoresce, or they phosphoresce, they produce a fluorescent pigment. And so is your, I think I told you a story about me doing this when I was in Puerto Rico. Uh, here's a guy just splashing around and you can see all the bioluminescence is occurring because of the dinoflagellates in the water, right? So if we look at the taxonomy, you can see our friends the ciliates here. Here's the apical complexins, right? Uh, and then here you can see are the core dinoflagellates right here. They are part of the uh, apical myplexin group, right? So different group, but I want to talk about them because they do cause problems for us, right? So they're planktonic, right? Um, they're unicellular. All, almost all of them are marine, right? So you're going to find them. When we talk about marine, we're talking about aquatic in nature, right? Most of the time it's in 
the sea, but it can also be in rivers or lakes or things like that. They release toxins. Um, and the toxins themselves can cause paralytic shelf poisoning, poisoning, which is uh, a neuropathic problem in humans, right? And also in fish, but right. And so the other thing I want to mention about them is they're made out of calcium silicates. So when they die, we have this stuff called diatomaceous earth that you can use as a natural insecticide uh, around your house. You just put it around your house and around the doorways and roaches and fleas and things like that that want to come in, they crawl through it. And when they crawl through it, it cuts them all up and they die. So it's a real nice way to control pest at your house without using chemicals. Okay. So this is one of the sad- Can you repeat that, that please? I'm sorry. Um, what what do you mean to repeat, uh, Dana? What we can use instead of chemicals to keep um, diatomaceous diatomaceous earth. Okay, thank you. Here, I'm, I'm going to write it for you. Diatomaceous earth. It looks kind of like chalky. You can buy it at Home Depot or Walmart or Lowe's. Uh, we have it. Um, yeah, if I if I remember, I'll take a picture of the package and I'll send it to you. But if you look at the outside of my doorways, it's kind of this chalky stuff that's around it, right? And that's um, and that's because we have diatomaceous earth, calcium calcium silicates. Okay. But the one of the one of the uh, saddest things uh, I've ever read, uh, and it's true, is this is an area. Um, right adjacent to Louisiana, and this whole area is hypoxic. And what that means is there's no oxygen there. So what that means is there's very little, there's very little, there's few living things there, right, this whole area. And mostly it's due to the influx of nutrients that is coming down the Mississippi River. And when it hits the Gulf of Mexico, there's this influx of nutrients, which then causes algal blooms and the algae completely remove all the oxygen from the environment, right? So this is not Louisiana, but you can see how the algae are growing on this side of the bay, right? But not on that side, right? Because they're somehow, they're, they're not allowed to get over into that kind of the bay area, not, not, the, not the sea area, okay? So you can see how these things spread, right? They have all these nutrients and then go crazy. I think um, like two years ago, maybe three, maybe a little bit longer, there was a big um, algal bloom in Florida and all the manatees were dying and they pulled out the manatees from the ocean to save them, right? Um, they put them in like, um, like SeaWorld was, was a big player. They put them in these really big tanks and so that they could get, they could get fresh water and things like that and they saved them and then when the algal boom was over they put them back in the natural habitat um, but um, but it can be really serious right this is what a red tide looks like this is Karenia that's causing it this is a red tide when, when and this this is this is dangerous right it'll kill all the wildlife and the filter feeders the clams and the mussels and the oysters will take in take in the toxins and it'll biomagnify them and so what you have are all these dead fish. This happened in Corpus around 20 years ago. And I was down there walking on the beach and throwing them away. And people were picking them up to eat them. I said, no, don't eat them because there's toxins in them and you could get really sick. And of course, nobody wants to listen to your friendly neighborhood microbiologists. They just want to do their own thing, right? But, uh, but here you basically have, um, oysters. And so I grew up in Corpus. I grew up gr eating raw oysters. I'd go fishing and lunch for me, I would take a lemon and a little bit of salt. And lunch for me would just be taking the oysters off of the jetties, open them up and eating raw oysters. And that was lunch, right? I don't do that anymore. I, uh, I love oysters, but I will not eat them raw anymore. I'll eat them in roux. I'll eat them fried. I'll eat them stewed. I'll, I'll eat them anyway, but I won't eat them raw anymore just because I like to mitigate risk, and to me, it's just not worth the risk of coming down with with paralytic shellfish poisoning. Yeah. Well, oh, uh, <laughs> eating them raw. 
Yeah, it, it, you can. I mean, and and Leo, there are some there are some bacteria that are really bad out there that can biomagnify on this. The one that the one that comes to mind, of course, is Vibrio, right? Vibrio. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So I don't know how I would feel about um, I don't know how I would feel about oysters coming from the from the area of Maine and uh, and New Hampshire and the Cape Cape Cod up there uh, in the Massachusetts area. I don't know how I feel about those guys. I guess I'd have to be there before I would do that. Uh, but I'm probably not going to eat them raw ever again, unfortunately. Okay, that's just me. But you know, it, if uh, so you're thinking, Pro-V, you're just, a, you're just really weird about this stuff. No, and I'm not the only one. So if, next time you're in uh, HEB and you want to buy oysters, they sometimes sell them in these little bitty brine-containing uh, uh, containers. Read the label. It's going to say, consuming raw shellfish can be hazardous to your health. And that's a lot of times on the menus in a lot of restaurants also because they know that, um, that potentially you could get sick, not only with Salmonella shigella and Vibrio, but also with Zaxatoxin, right? This is what the toxin looks like. And so if you remember, I used Zaxatoxin as a model of a, of a toxin for that first, um, for that first take home exam you did for me, right? Uh, and so I just, I just put a whole bunch of things together <laughs> to make this organism that was a fictitious organism, but it really hit home a lot of the concepts that you guys had learned about. And so a lot of you did really well uh, on answering the questions, right? So you guys earn, earn those points because of that, right? But if we ingest saxotoxin, which biomagnifies in oysters and things like that, then it can cause what we call paralytic shellfish poisoning. And what that simply means is that um, it becomes neuropathic and it can really cause your nervous system to shut down. It's one of the toxins that, um, it's one of the toxins that was used, I believe, to make zombies early on, right? So zombies weren't always made by viruses, right? Some of the zombies were made only by voodoo practitioners, right? So I, uh, I have, um, a really big interest in toxins. That's one of the things I like to think about. So I have lots of reference books on toxins. And so this one is entitled Seafood Toxins, right? And so it's got Chautauqua and a bunch of other toxins in there that nerds like me like to geek out on. Um, so I've done a lot of research on them and, um, and I like to think about them and the way they work and the mechanisms by which they work, right? So <clears throat> anyway, does anybody have any questions about anything we talked about today? So we, this is the malaria life cycle and we're gonna talk about this. This was done by me and um, one of my students several years back and it, it's a condensed version of it. And we're gonna be talking about this the first thing we do when we come back from spring break. I don't want to talk about it now because I think it'll lose its effectiveness because a lot of people are worried about the exam and they don't want to have anything real technical thrown at them right now. So what we'll do is we'll wait till we come back uh, from spring break and we'll we'll talk we'll take a look at this in, in pretty good detail. Okay, that'll be the first thing we we start with when we come back from spring break. Are there any questions about anything we covered today? Right, this first part of parasitology, we're going to be looking at the metazoans. Make your popcorn, Liz. We're going to be look, looking at the metazoans and the insects and the arachnids when we come back um, from spring break. Anybody have any questions? Hello. I don't think so. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, it's. 12.05, I guess, about 12.05, let's, uh, let's take, uh, let's come back at 12.15, let's take 10 minutes, and we'll go through the lab, and then we'll have some time to ask about um, anything you might have uh, about the exam you guys are going to take on Thursday.
Okay. So I will see you all.